So this is uh, this is my first computer system in 1978, and uh, I was uh, a member of the Northwest Computer Society then. Moved to Seattle in '78 and left the homebrew and joined the Northwest Computer Society. And they had a, a feature in their newsletter where every month some member would write up his computer system. And uh, Gail Sherry, who was a good club photographer, would come take a picture. This was uh, done with a 4x5 U camera, so it's a really nice negative. And I've got uh, a display out there where you can see a, a better version of that. So now, so this system cost uh, the computer with 36K memory, that was three 4K boards and two 8K boards, about $1,600. The terminal, a Hazeltine uh, terminal, was 1000 The floppy disk drive, which was two Shugard SA400 drives, 90K bytes of drive, was 900 bucks. The printer, which was uh, an IBM uh, Selectric uh, uh, 2741 uh, terminal, this is a bi-directional uh, terminal, was uh, 800 bucks. And then the rest of it, it came to about uh, $4,500. Last week, my wife reminded me that, uh, that uh, about the expense of that. And I had a 1979 Datsun 510 station wagon, which cost about as much as my home computer. <laughs> so that's, that's uh, and they were expensive in those days. What was the uh, operating system? It was uh, Flex, which was uh, uh, the standard operating system for 6800 microprocessors. Oh. Okay, that was the Southwest Tech 6800. Uh, and so what I'm going to talk about today is Southwest Tech computers, uh, hobbyist magazines, because everybody who got into computing was reading uh, popular electronics, radio electronics. 68 micro thermal. That's right. And uh, uh, the, uh, also I'll, I'll cover a uh, Motorola microprocessor. How it was developed. So we see here uh, Popular Electronics, 1975, January 1975. This is the most famous hobbyist magazine cover. Whenever they talk about Bill Gates, Paul Allen saw this magazine at Harvard Square, ran over and told Bill Gates, we can write software for this, and they started Microsoft. Right? Or MITS started in Albuquerque, New Mexico, selling computers. This is a famous one. So an earlier version of Popular Electronics was uh, Radio Amateur News started in 1919. This is a 1920 uh, uh, edition here. I think it's 20. I, actually, I can't see the screen here. Yeah. So it was uh, uh, it was hobbyist then. So this here uh, depicts uh, Mr. Uh, Galvin of, of uh, Tucko, New York. I don't know where that is. He, he's built a 160-pound radio-controlled car. And uh, with the telegraph key, by giving a certain number of clicks, it would go left, go right, go straight, stop. Okay? And they show uh, a fellow on a bicycle doing that. This is one of the earliest forms of texting while driving. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, the computer on, on the, the right, that's not a real Altair. The, the prototype got lost in shipment from Albuquerque, New Mexico, to, uh, to New York, so they, they needed to have one for the cover, so they built a prototype. And I mean, that's, that's actually a, a box with switches and lights on the front. Okay. And that was, yeah, it was a mock up. Now, the other thing over there, uh, in, back in the 20s, they also fudged a lot. That car would do three miles an hour. Okay. And, and Mr. Uh, Tucko, who would, he, he would run it in a parking lot, right? So it was kind of an exaggeration of having to keep up on a bicycle. But it was an exaggeration here. This, had a, this is a real computer. It had no I.O. and it had 256 bytes of memory. But to sell magazines, you had to, had to really push. So this here is, is a, a real Altair computer. And you can see that the, the front panel is quite different. And, and the boards are, uh, well, they don't, they don't show the boards. But if you look, you look at the magazine, I, I have some reprints of it out in, my, out, uh, in the area out there. It's an entirely different layout. Now, uh, what interesting thing. Uh, is that inside the magazine, the page before the, the article is an ad for a Southwest Technical Products <coughs> TV typewriter. It was the TV typewriter too, the CT1024. I actually built one of those, but that, that was you needed a terminal, and there was actually Southwest Tech's uh, uh, terminal. 
Now, Southwest Tax got started when Dan Meyer started writing for magazines like Radio Electronics and Popular Electronics. He was an engineer at Southwest Research Institute. That's kind of how he came up with the name Southwest Technical Products. And he, he well, the idea was that you de designed a project, wrote it up in a magazine, and then people would buy uh, circuit boards from you. So here is a, uh, oops. I'm really good with this remote here. I'll just point. So you, you buy a circuit board, and then this is the ultrasonic sensor. And he made this discovery. If you put things that were hard to get in your project, people would have to buy the kit from you. They couldn't scratch build it. Right? And so he, he turned this into a company. And it was the Daniel E. Meyer company, Dem, Demco. And it was at, at his house at uh, uh, 430 River you know, Redfoot Drive in San Antonio. Okay. And his first employee was Lucy Proctor. That's his housekeeper. So he was building the kits in the garage, and Lucy was packaging them up and sending them out. She became a bookkeeper at the company and, and was uh, employed there until 1987. And so uh, in 2006, uh, the, uh, the former employees of Southwest Tech had a, uh, a reunion dinner, and they invited me, and I got to interview uh, uh, Lucy. So now, Dan uh, <clears throat> got in well with Pocket Electronics, and he started writing uh, articles and having other people write articles, and he would sell kits of their parts. And so, uh, over here, this is December uh, 60, 67, uh, Little Tiger Amplifier. I built that. Okay? And uh, this other one over here, is Don Lancaster's earliest uh, uh, digital counter. Okay. Now, uh, they were so good at, at getting articles uh, published uh, that in 1967, seven of the 12 issues of Popular Electronics had a cover story of a, of a, a Southwest Tech uh, kit. Okay. And they, had, they did about uh, 65 articles from uh, in the year from 19, say, 66 to 72. So Southwest Tech didn't run ads in the magazines. They were on the cover. They didn't have to they run a little ad in the back say, send for our catalog. And here's one of their earliest catalogs. And it would, it would basically describe the kit and what issue of popular electronics it appeared in. And you ordered it, and they would send you a reprint of the article and the parts and the circuit board. Now, I didn't buy the circuit board. Uh, in the magazine, they would give a print of what the, the pattern looked like, and this is the little tiger amplifier. I actually built two of them, and I etched my own circuit boards. I didn't provide the fancy heat sink. I bent up some aluminum and whatnot, and I built uh, this little 20 watt stereo amplifier. <coughs> in fact, I didn't buy, I built numerous projects that Dan Meyer designed, and I didn't buy a, a kit from Southwest Tech until I got my computer. Okay. So, this is their. This is their office in, uh, in San Antonio in uh, 1967. Uh, with his help of his father in law, he bought four acres of land uh, in San Antonio, uh, 219 Rapsi, and that's where they were uh, until the end of 91. And he opened up this old, uh, built this old building. Well, Gary Kay, who was one of his designers, who designed the 6800 uh, uh, computer, uh, uh, took me there in 2006. And we had a tour of, of the building. And it was, uh, uh, it's now it's a food uh, testing laboratory. Stinks. <laughs> now here's Dan Meyer when he was written up in the San Antonio uh, uh, Express News newspaper. And this is in 72. <clears throat> His sales were up to a million dollars a year. Okay, And uh, by uh, in 76, when the computers took off, they were four million dollars a year. Okay. They got up to about 100 employees. And they had layoffs in about 87 when they, when they were uh, winding down. And they stayed in business until 91. At the tail end, they were doing uh, commercial computers, uh, uh, point of sale terminals, that kind of stuff. They, they left the hobbyist business in about 84. So here is a. Uh, Here's a, a typical catalog they had, and they, they had uh, 
uh, computer gear and audio gear to test with. And then this other computer here is their 1609 microprocessor. They actually did a 68000 system, but it was never released. That was about 87 when they were, when they were uh, running into difficulties. So here is uh, uh, an overview. Building number one, that's where that first office was. And they, uh, they expanded out uh, the, the whole building over here. And then they built two and three. These were manufacturing. Dan Meyer believed if you needed it, you, you, have, you produced it. Catalogs he printed on site. Everything, cabinets he made on site. It was double-sided circuit boards he had outsourced, but uh, everything else he did on site. And this building four is uh, a company store. Now, he actually had four other buildings on that four-acre site that used this for an income. So now, 1975 was uh, uh, computer magazines. This one. Uh, was when I got interested in them. So with the popular electronics, uh, well, Bill Gates and Paul Allen got theirs at the Harvard Square. I bought my uh, copy at, at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Right? I was down there. I, I was on the uh, DDG 35 USS Mitcher. We went down there for a month for uh, training and uh, went over to the Navy Exchange and, and got my copy. And I was very interested in that. And then later, in uh, uh, I, I was living in Norfolk, Virginia, and we moved back to San Francisco, and I picked up a bike magazine in an uh, uh, electronics store uh, in downtown uh, San Francisco. And the cover there was by Robert Tinney, and he became Byte's cover artist, and this was his first cover. Now, you hear the popular electronics, people refer to it as the January... Uh, 75 popular electronics, or uh, they confuse them. They say it's the December 74. Actually, it was it was published on November uh, 29, 1974. Popular electronics published a month early, and so <clears throat> this was out uh, in December. So people, uh, I mean, Paul Allen and Bill Gates read it before they left for uh, break uh, or Bill, uh, Bill left for break at uh, Christmas from Harvard. Okay. And I know that because. Uh, uh, Two years ago, we were vacationing in New York, I mean, in, in Washington, D.C. I uh, went over to the copyright office and rummaged through the, the card index and, and looked up the, the dates they were published. My wife didn't think that was one of the better places to go. <laughs> but in order to get in there, you have to get a library card from the Library of Congress, right? And I thought that was really great. She wasn't impressed about having a library card from the Library of Congress. <laughs> So then I worked for the Bike Shop San Mateo. It's a karate uh, studio now. Uh, so this was about five, whoops, back up. About five years ago. I took this picture. And uh, Chet Harris was the owner of that store. And it was down the, the hill from uh, College of San Mateo, where I was, uh, I was going at the time. And he had the, the one side uh, over by the car. Uh, that was the bike shop, and so I went down there as soon as it opened, and I, I talked to him, and later it expanded to, to both. And so, uh, at the time, he was, he was selling all the computers that were available, and uh, I worked there, and I basically took my pay in computer parts, and I've talked to several other people who worked in computer stores at the time, and they did the same thing, okay? And so, my first uh, kit that I got was the uh, a CT1024 terminal. Now that's a Sanyo monitor, which I used a, a Hitachi television set that was one that had a, a you could modify direct uh, video input. But uh, Chet or the bike shop was selling those, and I got I got one of those later. And then my computer. So uh, this is a Southwest Tech uh, computer, and uh, and this one uh, it has uh, the CPU board in it, a uh, single 4K memory board, and uh, I.O. And this cassette interface, this is, uh, this was great. It, it recorded at 300 baud. But, and the problem is, if you load it 8K basic, it was a five minute task. You know. uh, so when floppy disk came out, people really liked that. Now, I found this. This, is, this was my wish list that I was making up at the time. It actually goes on further down. And it shows you know, what my system was going to cost at list price. I was getting it at a discount at, at the store. 
And so uh, $395 for the computer, about $125 for the uh, 4K memory boards. So a TV typewriter was uh, $275. And it, it totaled up to $934. Okay? And this is an 8K system. I just purchased an 8 gigabyte system for less. Okay? A million times more memory. But this was... Uh, so this was was quite the, the system. It would it would run run basic, and you could uh, uh, write very small programs. And I assume up to, to 12k, and uh, and in the, like in the, the uh, opening shot, it was up to 36k with the with uh, multiple option boards. Also, when I was in San Francisco, I went to the first West Coast Computer Fair, and the Homebrew Computer Club kind of organized that. Jim Warren, who was the editor of Doctor Dobbs. It was a regular at Homebrew Computer Club, and uh, so he organized that, and he actually owned the show, but, but he managed to get the Homebrew Club to help, and that was a very uh, successful uh, show. There was uh, uh, every computer manufacturer was there. Apple was there with their, their uh, shiny booth and showing the Apple II. Mike Markle, who was one of the, uh, was their money guy, was formerly from Intel, and he bought uh, a trade, a used trade show booth from uh, uh, Intel, and Apple had this really deluxe uh, uh, booth, and they were showing the Apple II, and it was up and running. And uh, so it was uh, quite impressive. But every, everybody was uh, there, and you could buy computer uh, parts there, too. So it was an uh, interesting show. Now, uh, in 77, that's when ready-made computers came out. Before that, you needed to know which end of a soldering iron to hold if you wanted a computer. Right? And so there was the TRS-80 and the Apple and the PET. Now, the Apple uh, came out in June. You can buy the circuit boards in April. <coughs> the uh, Radio Shack was released in September. The first shipments of the PET were in December. Okay. Well, Chuck Peddle says that the way you should count who was first was who took the first checks from customers. And Commodore <laughs> took checks from customers very early in the year and didn't deliver until the end. But he, he says, <laughs> <laughs> he says they were first because they were the first ones to take money. <laughs> now, uh, uh, the owner of the, of the bike shop, San Mateo, was trying to set up uh, a distributorship. Uh, and he, was, uh, he talked to Mike Markle about funding that. And that didn't work out. But anyway, a month after the uh, first West Coast uh, Computer Fair, when they introduced the Apple, at the, at the bike shop, this is an ad that was a full, it was a full column ad that ran in the, uh, the San Mateo newspaper. It was, you know, come to the, uh, the store on, on May 21st and, and see a demo of the new Apple computer. So it wasn't released until June, so this was, was, was in between. And so that was, uh, 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 there were several people from Apple there. Mike Markle stopped by. He, they wanted to see how customers were, were reacting to things. And so that was a... a, a these are the kind of things where I just stumbled upon. It wasn't that you know I, I uh, uh, wrote some uh, great software, founded a magazine, started a, a, a computer show. I just happened to be wandering around and, and, and being at, at places to just see some interesting stuff. Now this is the uh, the second edition of the first Apple ad. Okay, one of the customers at the bike shop. Bill Kelly uh, worked for Regis McKenna, and he did this ad. Okay. And you, there's a, a woman over there in the kitchen, at the kitchen sink, on the, on the wall behind her is a nice apple on, on their uh, photograph one. And there's a gentleman in the front doing uh, uh, calculations on, on the computer. And in the first version of it, and this little smaller uh, insert uh, over here, there was the man and woman playing Paul. Some woman from Oregon wrote in and said, this is sexist. The guy's doing all this smart stuff, and, and the woman is just, you know, uh, hanging around. So they changed the ad. Also, what you see on here is this is the uh, picture they, they were saying you could buy the circuit board without the, without the case. Okay. So here is, here is Bill Kelly and, and a woman doing some very fancy calculations. Up on the board, it says Physics 370. Okay, so you know it's it's a uh, so they revised the ad. You also noticed in in this build the the computer that Bill Kelly is using 
there's no vent slots in the Apple. They had a hard time getting the vent slots in, in the early cases. Anyway, so, so uh, uh, Bill Kelly uh, also did ads for Intel and, uh, at, at Regis McKenna. And uh, they did some ads with the SDK uh, 80, which was a single board computer development computer for, for Intel. And he had a couple of them because after they had taken pictures of them, they bought, you know, Intel didn't want them back. And so, so Bill had them. And he would bring them down to the uh, bike shop because we had a teletype there. And, and uh, he could hook them up and, uh, and use them. Well, he also got a prototype uh, Apple II board from, from Apple. They, they gave him one. And he needed a power supply for that. So I built the power supply for his Apple II board. And uh, he gave me one of the SDK80 boards. <clears throat> and then, uh, also, I, I managed to, uh, to snag uh, Apple II serial number two for evaluation. So one Saturday in June, Chet Harris, the owner of the bike shop, went down to Apple and came back with Apple II serial number one and serial number two. He sold serial number one to a friend. And we had serial number two in, in the in the shop, and, uh, and so I took it home and hooked up to our TV and, and uh, took it to school. Showed showed various people this really neat uh, new computer, and the power supply died. So we sent it back to Apple and uh, didn't think much of it, and, and they you know because we got another one. Well, in 2005, I was telling uh, uh, Bruce uh, uh, Dahmer here that. Uh, the story, he said, well, I know where that is. He'd been over to visit Jeff Raskin, and Jeff Raskin had snagged it, uh, and, and he had it. And so here it is, serial number two, right? And so that was uh, uh, you know, another little accident that I happened on that one. Now here is the, uh, the SDK80 board that I got from Bill Kelly. Okay? And it's got a CPU and uh, 1K of RAM and... And here it's got uh, three 2708s. And below it is a video card, a Bay Area TV, uh, T, which was uh, a video, uh, big video circuit and a Southwest Tech keyboard. And so I built a computer like this, and I needed some software. So I wanted to get Tiny Basic for it. And so uh, I went to the Homebrew Computer Club uh, to a meeting, and I said, uh, in Interface Age, there was this uh, uh, story about. Uh, so we modified uh, Dr. Wang's, uh, Legion Wang's Palo Alto Tiny Basic to, to, to work uh, on the Intel uh, development system. Does anybody know uh, where I can get a copy of this? Well, the author, Jeff Raskin, was in the audience. He said, yeah, you know, set it up to me. So I went over to his house uh, later with two blank uh, 2708 EPROMs and left with two programmed ones. And I, and I plugged it in. And so I, that little computer was in, in a box, ran the... Uh, Ran a tiny basic. Now, before that, in the magazines, they would publish the entire source code with assembly listing. So you could just you could just start typing in the, the hex and, and save it out on cassette tape, but this this was a 4K long, that would take a while. So it was nice having someone to uh, provide it. Now also, this here, the listing that he has, it has uh, uh, it has copy left. Uh, all rights, all, all, all wrongs reserved. reserved, right? And so <laughs> when you hear about a copyright, uh, copyleft license, this is uh, one of the earliest <coughs> ones I found. <laughs> Moved up to Seattle in January of 78, uh, uh, and after we had uh, uh, signed papers uh, on a house, the next important thing was to find all the local computer stores. Okay, And so went over to the retail computer st uh, store, in, in the Green Lake area of Seattle. And the clerk there was Bob Wallace. And so he gave me a copy of the, the Northwest Computer Society newsletter and invited me to the uh, meetings. And they were held at the Pacific Science Center, which is where the, the Space Needle in Seattle is located. Okay. And uh, the Bob uh, later became the, uh, the ninth employee at, uh, uh, at Microsoft. Well, uh, at this time, he was the founder of the Northwest Computer Society, a clerk at the retail computer store, and a graduate student at, in computer science at uh, University of Washington. When he graduated from uh, uh, UW, he went down to Albuquerque uh, to join Microsoft. But he, he knew they were moving back up to Seattle, because they, they, uh, they moved back up uh, in about a year to Bellevue, Washington. 
Okay. Now, uh, so here is a uh, kind of the headline at, uh, uh, of the uh, club newsletter. I have, a, I have several about in the, the display area. Uh, by this time, we moved to the Seattle University uh, Library uh, for meetings. And at the bottom here, it says that uh, Tim Patterson was going to do a demo of his new 8086 board that he's designing. Tim was a member of, of uh, the club and, it, and also worked at Seattle Computer Products. And Seattle Computer Products uh, uh, did uh, an 8086 system. We yeah. had one. Here's and uh, Microsoft used that when they wrote 8086 Basic. Tim took his, his prototype over and, and they uh, used it to run uh, 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 8086 Basic. They went to uh, several of the big computer shows, and when they were demoing it, it was with a uh, uh, Seattle Computer Products system. Uh, Tim didn't show up for this. Uh, uh, in here, it says he's going to uh, show up for me. That didn't happen often in our newsletter. The, 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 the guest that was going to be happening next month didn't happen. But later on, that uh, several months later, some people from Seattle Computer Box came over with the finished system. I uh, sent uh, uh, Tim an email a few weeks ago, and he said at this time, he only had one prototype working. And they had a complete system, and they were talking about how they couldn't get uh, digital research to give to produce CPM 86. And so they were selling a system that had Microsoft Basic, but didn't have an operating system for it. So Tim Patterson uh, uh, needed an operating system. And so in three months part-time, he wrote QDOS, Quick and Dirty Disk Operating System. And that was that became MS-DOS. Right? And it was all because digital research wouldn't provide uh, 8086. They were going to get around to it someday. And Seattle Computer Products had computers today. And so that, that cost somebody a lot of money. I, Seattle Computer Products got a million for it total. But uh, digital research didn't do so well. Now covered 6,800 microprocessor. Uh, a couple of years ago, you had Chuck Peddle, and his uh, he was he was describing how uh, uh, he invented the computer industry. Uh, real modest fellow, but anyway, <laughs> he, after the years, uh, memories change, I guess. Mm -hmm. So most people think that uh, you read uh, accounts where after Motorola saw the Intel 8080. They turned out the 6800. Not true. They were developed in parallel. And neither side knew you know, exactly what the other one was doing. So they start, both started laying out in December of 1972. The 8080 first silicon was January of 74. And the first silicon for the 6800 was uh, February of 74. And they start then uh, uh, providing samples uh, to various customers. Now, Motorola's customers were Hewlett Packard, Tektronics, National Cash Register. They were looking at selling to big companies because that's what Motorola uh, did. They, they weren't interested in one CQC hobbyist. They, they, they were looking for people who had. Uh, neither really was Intel. No, Intel wasn't either. No, it, it, if uh, Ed Roberts hadn't come up with uh, the Altair, uh, they wouldn't have been in that hobby market either. Okay. So Intel was using the same process on their, on their microprocessor they were using for EPROMs. And uh, that was a three voltage process, plus five volts, plus 12 volts, and minus five volts. Motorola did not have, a, at the time, did not have a, a, an N channel MOSFET process. And they were also going, they were using a five volt only uh, uh, step that required a, uh, a voltage doubler to generate the minus voltage and, and whatnot on the chip. And there was a whole new process. They had a devil of time getting that uh, process down. Um, and it wasn't until about uh, November they were in, in full in produ production. Now, they also, their design goal was 180 mils on the side for the chip. And it was 212 mils on the side when they got done. And, the, and that was to the point, chips that big in 1974, 75 had very low yield. Okay. And so they, they were, it took them a while to, uh, to turn that. Now, uh, what is interesting is both design teams from Intel and uh, uh, Motorola quit. The Intel team left and formed Zilog, and they did the Z80. 
And then uh, the Motorola team, most of those left and, and went to Moss Technology, did the 6502. And the first computers, the the uh, Radio Shack was Z80, the Apple and the, and the Commodore were 6502. The first generation of, of uh, personal computers were done by, uh, used uh, a microprocessor developed by Renegade Engineers. Just Now, uh, this is, uh, uh, I've got several copies of, of I've enjoyed doing research on on, uh, on exactly how the 1600 started because Motorola didn't uh, chronicle their development. Intel chronicled the development of the microprocessor, so everybody know would know who, who did it. It was interesting when various employees quit uh, and went to work for a competitor. Their role in the development of the microprocessor would be toned down in, in the, the next version of the story from Intel. It's kind of like the Soviet Union where they erase people from the picture. And uh, that's why uh, uh, Ted Hoff and, and uh, Stan Mazur get most of the credit in, in some of the early accounts because they stayed employed at Intel. And, and we see uh, here, this is Motorola had did a they were doing a complete system, not just a, a processor. They had I.O. chips, uh, RAM, ROM, serial parallel I.O., modems. Uh, it was uh, uh, a complete system. Now, when they did the 6800, before they had the chip, in like 1973, they were able to run programs because they had taken 451 TTL chips and built... Uh, a microprocessor on ten, I mean on five boards that were ten by ten inches, okay. and and uh, they could they could modify it as they were doing revisions uh, in the logic. What's that bus? What's nice this custom bus on the? Uh, yeah, it is. It was whatever they were uh, uh, doing. You know, the application session you were doing, and then they uh, they got it reduced down to one board by using uh, ROMs for state machines and uh, MSI components. <laughs> And down, down here is the chip, right? But so they were they were running software before they had working silicon. And they also Motorola had they did uh, circuit simulations using a, a large IBM computer. They could simulate uh, uh, in, in a, with a spice like uh, language simulate like fifty MOSFETs. And so before they laid out the chip, they knew it was going to run at one megahertz. Okay? So they uh, they did a lot of simulation like that. Which was very beneficial to the guys who left uh, at uh, Moss Technology because they, they, they learned a lot on Motorola's dying. Now, this here is one of the earliest prototype boards. And uh, uh, this was, uh, was, was built by John uh, Buchanan. You know, John Buchanan and uh, Chuck Peddle. Okay. Chuck Peddle joined Motorola in 73. After the microprocessor was was fairly well complete, it was it was it was already past the layout. And uh, this here is a gift of, uh, of you look here, it, uh, Thomas 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 Bennett. Thomas uh, Tom Bennett. Uh, he's the architect of, of the sixty eight hundred. Okay. Chuck Pedal was. This is the first ad for the. Um, Motorola's ad, and it uh, it shows the, the complete family of chips all the way down to the modem, and they give some applications. Uh, this is word processing, point of sales terminal, and bowling alley scoring machines. Okay. <laughs> Those were you know, applications. There's yeah. some excuse for these things. Yeah. Now here is Moss Technologies uh, ad, where this one here is. Uh, they're announcing the uh, 6501, and this was uh, in August. And about two weeks later, they read this ad to where they were announcing the 6501 and 6502. And this would plug into uh, the Motorola bus, and it was uh, 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 it used different architecture inside. It was much they they uh, stripped down the, the the design of the chip to get rid of. Uh, a lot of things, so, so it, was, it was much smaller. They, they figured out that you really didn't need uh, tri-state buffers on the uh, address bus, which made it handy for uh, doing DMA transfer, but that, those buffers took up a lot of room. So they, they uh, in their uh, 
in their knowledge of what Motorola did wrong, they were able to, to shrink it down. So they were uh, they had a low price on it. But that low price was a uh, kind of just a marketing ploy that Intel and, and Motorola both said when they announced the chip, they were three hundred sixty dollars per quantity one. IBM three sixty. Okay, but they were really about one hundred seventy five dollars for the chip. And if you were if you're like Ed Roberts and you said I'll buy a thousand of them from the out here, they were he got them for seventy five dollars a chip. So the three hundred sixty dollar price was wasn't really a, a price. And if you were Hewlett Packard or uh, Tektronix, Motorola gave you all the samples you needed. So here is uh, uh, an ad in uh, EDN, and uh, 650X was uh, a two and a half generation microprocessor. The Zilog, they were a third generation microprocessor. So, so this here is uh, one of the first uh, stories. And actually, Byte Magazine also covered it. Chuck Peddle was really brilliant at marketing. That 6502, they had engineering samples. They got it first silicon, and then he was out selling it. No real company would would sell, you know, chips that that were barely working. You know, that the rotate write instruction didn't work in, in the first ones, uh, and so they just left it off the data sheet. Right now, in May, when uh, seventy six, when when they got chips that you know, a new instruction showed up. Right, but it, it was it was uh, he was really effective at selling. Okay. I mean, because it, it was a very tiny company against giants. Motorola was like a billion dollar company at the time. But what they were selling, when, when he talks about the $300, uh, Motorola had a $300 chip compared to his $20 chip, $25 chip, for $300 got you a complete set of chips. Okay? And uh, uh, you just got the microprocessor from, from, uh, from Lostech. And after he announced that, Motorola, they immediately cut the price of the design kit to a $149 from $300. They put it in a circuit board too. And they cut the, uh, the CPU price from $175 to $69. The next thing they did is they sued Moss Technology. And that was uh, uh, Motorola, it was a billion dollar company. Moss Technology uh, was small. Their financial backers said, Here, you guys, uh, they, they sold the company back to the founders. Uh, uh, because they, they were, you know, they weren't interested in fighting Motorola. Now, what uh, Motorola had already started on their second generation chips, and uh, they also had numerous patents that were going to show up in, in about uh, June. So they had like twenty patents on, on the microprocessor. So Moss Technology would not have been able to produce chips. Besides that, Motorola had more lawyers than, than Moss Technology had people. So. They, they uh, settled the lawsuit in May of 76, and Moss Technology paid Motorola $200,000, and, and under court order, they returned all of the confidential documents they took. Okay. And uh, they dropped the, the, the 6800 compatible microprocessor, and then they uh, both companies agreed to cross-license peripherals and, and chips, because Moss Technology couldn't, they couldn't make, Motorola had a patent on the bus, so they couldn't hook anything up to their chip without a cross-license agreement. So why did Motorola agree? Uh, I don't know. I, I found two articles that <coughs> describe the settlement, but I, I have no idea as why. Motorola was undergoing a lot of management changes. 1974, with the oil embargo, was a, a huge uh, uh, layoffs in, in the semiconductor industry. I mean, in uh, magazines like Electronics, they talk about such and such company was laying off 7,000 this month. You know? mm -hmm. Intel laid off one third of their employees, right? and so there was a lot of chaos in Motorola because the semiconductor division was kind of bloated, and they, they totally changed management. So uh, it could have just been chaos, you know. Uh, I think the, um, one of the biggest reasons behind that lawsuit is that the sixty five hundred one was pre compatible with the sixty eight. Yes, it was, and that's when they had yeah they had a drop down. Yeah. At which point did they come out with the Kim one board? The Kim One board came out. Uh, uh, Moss Technology came out with that. Oh, some uh, sometime in in, uh, in seventy six. I forget exactly when. Uh, uh, but but they, they came out with, with that. That was uh, uh, again. That was a very clever marketing tool because you could uh, uh, 
you didn't need a teletype with that. So I mean, Chuck Pedal was really good at, at sales. I understand why first apples had um, jumper pins on the motherboard that allowed you to use either the 6300 or the 6300. Yes, the, the Apple One, if you uh, if you look at the board, it says it'll, it'll, you can convert it. It was a slight, the pinout uh, changed quite a bit from the 68, uh, uh, it was like an off by one uh, rotation on, on the uh, uh, 6800 versus the 6502. But but you could make a little adapter boards and whatnot to, to switch them. But I've, I've, uh, I looked at Apple Ones in the, in the day, but I've never uh, bothered to try to switch one. The hobby market took like fish to water once Kim One came out. Well, it did. And like I said, the, the 6502 and the Z80 really drove, they, they had the hobby market in, in 77. And these were uh, spin offs from Motorola and Intel. And Motorola and Intel came back with, uh, uh, Intel got the IBM PC and uh, Motorola got the, the Mac. So they did it okay in the long run. And Motorola, with the name of Motorola, they're one of their target companies was was the auto industry. In the 6805, they sold those by millions to the auto industry. So this is a Southwest Tech. This is a kind of a I I had everything on this photo. This is off one of their catalogs. But at, at one time, I had every every piece of uh, computer equipment that uh, Southwest Tech sold. Wait, I was always wondering what made you pick. TPC over the other I think because when I found out that when I realized that all these hobby kits they've been building from Dan Myers and their Southwest Tech that they were a real company they had some experience and they weren't going to fold in, in uh, six months like a lot of uh, computer companies were started up by hobbyists and didn't know how to run a sphere of, of Ogden Utah that place flamed out right away because they they uh, didn't know how to run a business right so that was a uh, uh, Southwest Tech was a, a substantial company. So now this is the designer of the, uh, Gary Kay was the designer of the 6800 uh, system. He'd been working at Southwest Tech since he was in high school. And in uh, uh, December of 1970, the first article he had published was this, this Nixie clock. It was published in Popular Electronics. And in uh, about 2000, uh, I don't know, 2005, I decided, well, this would be a good thing to build to, to display at Vintage Computer Festival. And so I, uh, I uh, laid out all the circuit boards, ordered the circuit boards for the power supply and, and the clock generator and the Nixie tube displays, and got the whole thing built, and it didn't work right. And so I, uh, uh, I fired off an email one uh, Saturday evening to uh, Gary Kay saying, uh, this is what I've done, and on, on my website I had all the uh, uh, schematics and, and the original article, and I said, it's not working right. <clears throat> and I went to bed. And about six hours later, in the middle of the night, he sends back a response. Okay, This is a magazine article he wrote 35 years before. Right? <laughs> and and he, he says, well, you know, in the article it was kind of confusing that, that these two lines have to be tied together. Right? So... <laughs> and actually, my title on the uh, 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 the email was uh, was to uh, uh, the clock was called the DigiVista DigiVista Tech Support, and so I, I <laughs> yeah. So now this here, now this uh, uh, cover here was for actually from Radio Electronics. This is a, a guitar preamplifier that. Uh, uh, Gary had uh, designed, and it was in June of, of uh, uh, 74. And the, the other catalog over here was uh, in early 75. Most of the pages are identical, but they switched from selling uh, audio gear, I mean, focusing on audio gear to digital as soon as the Altair came out. And, uh, uh, and in, oh, in, uh, I mean, the company dropped all the audio gear in about 84 and just totally focused on, on computers. So, if we look at a, a computer like this, the, it has seven slots in, in the front. You have a CPU board and you put six memory cards in there. It has eight I.O. slots in the back. And the power supply was uh, 8 volts and 10 amps. And if you had, uh, if you loaded up the memory boards, 
it, it was uh, it was kind of say I replaced the transformer by this this actually you know, belongs to a friend of mine, Bill Bodal. And if you look at the close up picture, you notice the transformer at the top is kind of busted, you know, like from overheating. Because he had this thing stuffed full of, of cards. Every slot was full. And it, you know, was the top on the power supply. Okay. How much RAM was it? Well, you could, uh, in, in, a, in a stock Southwest Tech, you could only get uh, 40K in there. Okay. And so here's the CPU board. Now, Southwest Tech, they've been selling kits for over a decade. And they were easy to assemble. That they, you had the traces were very wide. Okay, here's the CPU. Uh, this is a, a 128 byte RAM, and here is a, a, the ROM, and here's a, a the baud rate generator. Now, with, with this and an I/O card, you could uh, uh, you had a computer system. You didn't, didn't need a memory board. Now, this used the Micbug uh, ROM, which Motorola developed. Uh, for uh, for their uh, design system that, that the chip system had, there. And so this uh, uh, made it very popular because it was at a standard. Uh, uh, you turned it on. It didn't have have uh, front panel switches. Motorola microprocessor sixteen hundred was dynamic. You couldn't stop it. So eighty eighty you could halt it. So it worked with the front panel, but the sixteen hundred really wouldn't work with the front panel. Okay. And here is a uh, a memory board. And uh, this here is uh, uh, 4K of, of uh, tw uh, 2102s. And your memory test program was your friend. Because when you got one of these boards and, and you built it, you'd run a memory test on it and find out when you had any solder bridges or whatnot. But then the chips would, they were flaky. So they would, I mean, even if you were getting quality chips, they would burn out. And after a, a year or so of running it and you replaced two or three <coughs> chips, your memory board was, was solid. But uh, uh, running a uh, memory test was... Uh, was common occurrence. And then here, uh, there was other companies made boards. Seals figured out how, to, how many chips you could pack on a board, and they got an <laughs> 8K, right? And then later they started using bigger chips, and, and it, uh, you know, it reduced the size. Okay. And here's an example of, of a serial interface okay, from Southwest Tech. But other companies made them. This is uh, an EEPROM program of 27 weight. So this would plug into the 30 pin bus on the back. And then here was the uh, the real blessing getting a, a, a floppy disk system with uh, 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 nine hundred bucks and it would uh, hold uh, ninety k on a disk. And yeah, the computer in the same box as the floppy. No, this was this this was just the two Sugar SA four hundred drives and the power supply for them, and there was a an I O card in the uh, uh, in the computer. <coughs> now personal computer show. Gary K sent me a scan of his ticket. Uh, yesterday we had a group here talking about uh, mentioning how they ran this. So this here was uh, uh, Southwest Tech uh, was at the show. They were one of the people exhibiting there, and uh, they had uh, <laughs> they were they, they printed up some shirts. And the show management wanted them to wear their Altair sucks shirts. So this is this is Gary K with the shirt holding it up. This is uh, uh, Dan Meyer, the founder. And here's Joe Dyer. So he's, he's one of the other engineers. Uh, uh, Robert Duderick is, is still still around. I've uh, been in email contact with him. And he had two sons there, Stephen and uh, uh, Todd. And uh, the reason that uh, well, he, he wrote the software, and the reason he, he wrote the software was that uh, he, had his, he had a shipping company. His family had a shipping company. He had an IBM. Uh, <coughs> Portable computer was it the 5100 was the the portable and he would take it home and his kids would use it to program in basic and so he bought a, a very early Southwest Tech 6800 and he assembled it for the kids and they had a teletype and they said okay well where's the basic well Southwest Tech didn't have a basic yet so he got Dr Dobbs uh, and uh, they had an article about how to write Tiny Basic and so, so he set out to to write. Uh, 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 a basic, and it appeared in the uh, 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 Southwest Tech newsletter, and then they start selling it. And rather than Bill Gates prices, it was five dollars for the uh, 4K version and ten dollars for the 8K version. Then here's a nice. Uh, this is a Southwest Tech PR40 printer. It was pretty popular. This is a, a cash register uh, mechanism. 
I would go to department stores and I'd say, oh, and I'd go look at the look inside their 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 cash register. And I'd say, yeah, that, that definitely had it was the same printer mechanism that, that the PR40 had. So nice pause there. And then here's uh, an example of the printout. It's 40 columns. Okay. Now the Apple computer also had 40 columns. Okay. So Steve Jobs wrote a, a technical article in uh, 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 Interface uh, Magazine. Uh, interfacing the Apple computer. And an example, he's interfacing it to a PR40. Here's a uh, sample printout. So uh, I've got the article, I've got the magazine uh, in my booth. So Steve Jobs wrote very few technical articles. He was more of a marketing guy. Now, this is uh, uh, Robert Buterich's uh, uh, basic. And they, they introduced this. Well, after he wrote the version, and, and they published the source code listing in the first newsletter, uh, he improved it and came up with a 4K and an 8K version. An 8K version of BASIC had uh, advanced math, had trig functions and, and, and uh, whatnot, and it would have, uh, it could do uh, words, it had string functions for, for uh, dealing with letters and words. And so the, they were going to sell uh, these at, at, the, at the show in Atlantic City. And the night before, they uh, discovered a bug, where uh, in a math bug, and so they fixed it and they re-recorded all of them, and uh, and they changed, they penciled in or ink picked in uh, the version from uh, 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 one one oh to one oh one, and they and they sold them at the Atlantic City show. And that was the, the the first introduction of that. Now, <clears throat> when you're tele when you have a teletype as your your main source of entry. You don't use that to edit source code. The way source code, you, when you wrote assembly language in, in those days, you got a, a, a pad. Uh, legal pads were popular. So this is uh, Robert Uterich sent me uh, his original copy of, of, uh, uh, of Southwest Tech Basic. And you just write down all the instructions here. Okay? Now, when Bill Gates did Altair Basic, he used yellow you know, legal pads too. That was, uh, uh, if you look at some of these teletypes that they have out here running, you cannot uh, edit at, at 110 baud. I mean, it's not, uh, you, can't, uh, you can't think of it that slow. So, and then, so what I did is, is I took, uh, here is his handwritten code, and here is after I, I put it in and assembled it, and so here's the code, and then here's the, the the opcodes for it over here. And so that, that's how you, you edited software, or, or created software in the, uh, your, your choice, your, your, it wasn't what you're using Emacs or VI, it was what brand of pencil you were using. <laughs> now also at the Atlantic City show, uh, the uh, editor of Interface Age uh, decided that it'd be really neat if you could deliver software in a magazine. And so, so instead of a cassette tape, you put a little record in a magazine, right? And Processor Tech was, they were going to release their basic uh, this way, but, but they, uh, uh, they couldn't get it done. And so uh, uh, Dan Byers of Southwest Tech said, well, we'll, we'll give you ours. And so uh, Robert Uterich worked with uh, 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 this, the company, Evitone. They would normally would sell would deliver samples of, of, of regular 45 RPM uh, records and whatnot in magazines. And they ended up taking uh, an AC30 uh, cassette interface <laughs> and hooking that up in a recording machine and, uh, and recorded it on there. And so you play this and it's, uh, you know, the... You go backwards and record that onto tape to then load it? Yeah, you can load it. Or else, if you wanted to, you could put this on your turntable and load it in, into your computer. <laughs> and that was called the Floppy ROM, and, and they did uh, several of, uh, of those. Uh, they probably published about five of those, right? But the first one was uh, was uh, the Southwest Tech Basic. Okay. So, I don't know if we have any time, but anybody have any questions? I'll, I'll be out, out in, the, in the, the show area, too. Any questions? Do you have this presentation available online? Uh, no, I don't. I actually, I'm going to put it online. Okay. And your website is? Well, I have, uh, my website is uh, uh, www.swtpc.com. Okay. 
And uh, actually, I don't own the website. I just provided all the content for it. <coughs> and also, I, I do articles in Wikipedia. So I've written uh, articles on uh, 1600 microprocessor and, and uh, uh, NITS, uh, uh, Altair 8080, uh, biography of Ed Roberts, and whatnot. I've got a list of the articles now. I've done. So, so I enjoy doing the research. So going back and finding the first uh, 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 <coughs> mention of, of, of Motorola microprocessor in a uh, in a magazine, you know, that's you know, I find that interesting. Five years ago, I was restoring all my Southwest tech equipment. After I got it all working, I did something else. Question? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'd like to give an anecdote about Southwest technical product in John Mayer. <clears throat> when I got my first Model 1 TRS-80, it was, you know, the programs were coming on, on cassettes, on tape. And if you try to duplicate your cassettes um, in an analog form, you know, from one tape record to another, after the second generation, you would start getting errors because of jitter. So I wrote a program for machine language for model one, which would sort of make little windows, so it would take care of the jitter, so you could duplicate like, make like 10, 15 copies of the same cassette without errors. And this requires a program for model one and a little interface circuits, circuit. So I contacted um, Don Meyer and he designed the, the, you see, the circuit to, and he was selling the kit. Now I noticed that you know, my circuit he was using as a NAND gate or air end gate and his, the, the circuit he, did, he was selling was using OR gates with the same, same function. So I asked him, how come you, you change it? Well, you were out of NAND gates, so we were <laughs> 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 so for our gates. Well, companies have qualified parts list. And, okay. and they, it was great. Yeah. Yeah, I wrote quite a number of articles of popular electronics, radio electronics, and, yeah. and Southwest Technical was selling the kids. So what was your, what's your name? The Castle Okay. Yeah. Uh, I took um, some. I went to Tumpe University, and in the evening professional classes, there was a guy who taught computer architecture named Will Mathis. And I don't know if you know of him. He was one of the he was one of the co-founders um, with Chuck Pedal, and he had a lot of interesting information to share about. He was he's very quiet. He's uh -huh. not at all like Chuck, but about the lawsuit, about um, the settlement, and all that. And you might want to look him up because he had a lot of interesting uh -huh. color. On that, on that well, what, so what, what, I, what I found on that was I found uh, I found two sources, two magazines, one in uh, uh, SEC interface and one in electronics that described they had to pay two hundred thousand dollars in, in a return documents, yeah. and it's like that. Uh, uh, Motorola had uh, uh, all this infrastructure. They had computers for doing simulation. They, they did uh, uh, simulation of, of you could run the code ahead and all that stuff. And most they had nothing, but they they were able to turn out a chip in a year, and uh, turned out that they well, they they left with a lot of information. Right. They actually left with documents too. Right. So it's kind of well. <coughs> the actual judgment should be uh, public record. It is, but, the but it is, but you have uh, you would have to go uh, uh, go to pay. You know, there's they have firms to do legal searches and whatnot, and so I don't know how to do legal searches. Probably not. If they settle, yeah, it's probably not. Yeah. Yeah. But so that's um, um, now. Most technology didn't do well after the lawsuit because most of the engineers quit because they, they were just doing depositions all day, and they were uh, had to sell off the Commodore. Right? And so it's kind of hard to find one of those guys that has anything positive to say about Motorola. So it's, it's kind of a, uh, when you go off and, and your company gets destroyed, you, know, you, you kind of set your, your tone there. Motorola, they just pushed on. They moved, uh, uh, they moved uh, uh, to Austin, Texas, yep. and their, uh, uh, the new people that uh, did it, that's 
uh, developed chips, faster ones, and everything. Any other questions? What's the biggest SWT PC that you own? I assume you moved to 16 or 9. I've got a uh, I've got a 16 or 9 one with uh, <laughs> maybe uh, 512. Uh, I, I have one that I need to repair that was running uh, OS 9 with, with 256K. Yeah, I, 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 I have two 256 k boards. And, uh, okay. I got that free. When you have a website and you have all the documentation, people say, you know, I've got this old computer in the garage and, and I don't want to throw it away, right? And so you, you get a lot of stuff for free there. Okay. Well, thanks for... Uh